Good morning, everyone. My name is Becky Seabrook, and I want to wish you all a, a very warm welcome from Houston, Texas at the Health Museum. Um, I am the Senior Director of Guest Engagement here, and I'm very excited for our program this morning, Preventing the Next Pandemic, a conversation with Helen Branswell and Dr. Peter Hotez. Um, Helen Branswell is a senior writer at the STAT News Organization. She's coming to us this morning out of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, at STAT, she's an infectious disease and global health senior writer there. Um, she joined STAT in 2015 when it was founded and was introduced to epidemic reporting during the Toronto SARS outbreak in 2003. In the years since, she's written about so many different outbreaks, including bird flu, the H1N1 flu pandemic, Ebola, Zika, acute flaccid myelitis, measles, and is now the um, heading up stats coverage of the coronavirus pandemic. And as many of you may know, has been incredible coverage throughout. Uh, she spent the summer of 2004 embedded at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as a CDC Knight Fellow. In 2010 and 2011, she was a Neiman Global Health Fellow at Harvard, where she focused on polio eradication. She won the Association of Healthcare Journalists Award in 2018 for the reporting on infectious disease and global health, and was recently awarded the 2020 George Polk Journalism Award for public service for her extensive coverage of this COVID-19 pandemic that we've all been living with for the past year. And it began on January 4th with the post about a growing cluster of unexplained pneumonia cases in Wuhan. So you've been, <laughs> you've been following this since literally the, the very beginning. Helen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. And um, a familiar face for, <laughs> for many of us, um, Dr. Peter Hotez, who is a professor of pediatrics and molecular biology and microbiology and the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, there, his research includes work on the SARS vaccines and the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. He's also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. He was awarded the Abraham Horowitz Award for Excellence in Leadership in Inter-American Health by the Pan-American Health Organization of the World Health Organization, served in the Obama administration as the U.S. Science Envoy Envoy and was appointed by the U.S. State Department to serve on the Board of Governors for the U.S. Israel Binational Science Foundation. He, I don't know how he does it, but he's found time to write several books as he's very passionate about um, the conversation between research and, and the general public. His uh, books include Blue Marble Health, an innovative plan to fight diseases of the poor and mid wealth, Autism Dad, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, vaccines did not cause Rachel's autism, my journey as a vaccine scientist, pediatrician, and autism dad. And his latest book, which is what brings us here this morning, um, is Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science, which explores the socio-political, economic, and environmental factors that drive infectious disease and tropical disease and the role, the role that vaccine diplomacy can play in addressing them. So Dr. Hotez, thank you so much. I know you're extremely busy as well. And we're really, really glad to have you here today. Um, at this point, I am going to turn this over to our two wonderful speakers. I'm really excited about the conversation this morning. And again, I invite you all, if you do have any questions that you have for the speakers to put them in the Q&A chat and we will be following those as we go. So at this point, Helen and Dr. Hotez, I'm gonna turn it over. Okay. So what I do for a living is ask questions, and I'm going to start doing that now. Um, Wait, before you do that, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with you, Helen. Um, oh, thank you know, you. I, I, you know, I, when you're one of the first people I look look for when I wake up in the morning in terms of following this pandemic, and you've done <laughs> such an incredible service to humanity by, you know, giving us really um, uh, timely and important information. I just wanted to thank you for that. No, well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, so, I, I, like as Becky said, I don't know where you find the time to do everything and write books, but you have a new one out and um, the title is Dear in My Heart, Preventing the Next Pandemic, because I really would like this to be the last pandemic I cover, I, I have to say. 
Uh, I don't know that that's likely, but it, it would be great. The subtitle is Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And I was hoping you could give us um, your definition of what vaccine diplomacy is. What, what does that mean to you and, and to the broader world? Yeah, well, you know, I started actually writing this book about a year before um, COVID-19 began. Um, and I think one of the points of the book is that what happened with what's happening with COVID-19 is not the extraordinary event that many claim it is, but rather a culminating event of a lot of unraveling that's been happening uh, over the last few years. And it kind of chronicles the collapse, uh, I don't want to say total collapse, but partial unraveling of global health infrastructure and all the things that we've put in place, uh, which includes uh, a lot of vaccine diplomacy. And by vaccine diplomacy, I define it broadly as cooperation between nations uh, around global health, but particularly vaccines, because vaccines are such powerful tools uh, in, in global health. And, and I, the beginning of it actually goes with the, be the, the beginning of vaccines. So when Edward Jenner developed the first smallpox vaccine back in the late 1700s, some say 1798, he was immediately called upon to mediate prisoner exchanges between the British and the French during the Napoleonic Wars. And, and Thomas Jefferson used his vaccine as a goodwill gesture to, with, to send the vaccine with the Lewis and Clark expedition in their exploration of the wilderness uh, with Native American uh, groups. And the more modern version began with Albert Sabin, who not many people realized that when he developed the oral polio vaccine, he did it jointly with the Soviets at, at the height of the Cold War. Albert Sabin sent his polio strains to uh, the USSR, got permission from State Department and, the Soviet, and this, his Soviet counterpart, Dr. Chumakov, whose son uh, actually works at FDA and is a, is a friend and colleague, um, got permission to work together. That's where the vaccine was developed, tested on 10 million Soviet school children, shown to be safe and effective, and ultimately led to the licensure of the polio vaccine. And then it happened again for smallpox eradication. The Soviets found a way to scale up freeze-dried production of the smallpox vaccine, which allowed you to take that lyophilized version into tropical areas and so it wouldn't be destroyed by heat. And that's what allowed D.A. Henderson, an American, to lead the smallpox eradication campaign. So the point is our, our great, some of our greatest successes in global health, at least around infectious diseases, always relied on international cooperation and cooperation between countries which generally did not agree ideolo ideologically and they're willing to put aside their ideologies to work together. And, and this is something that I was been so impressed with as a vaccine scientist over the years that I said, hmm, how can we sort of dust this off and maybe give it a fresh coat of paint and reinvigorate it? And I had that role as U.S. science envoy for, uh, for the State Department and the White House in between 2014 and 2016 in the Obama White House at a very difficult time in the Middle East when it's when the ISIS occupation was starting. It's when uh, we, we were at the height of the Syrian conflict and civil war. It's when the proxy wars between Iran and Saudi Arabia were uh, beginning in Yemen. And so at a very uh, awful time, looking at how we can cooperate between Muslim majority nations for vaccine development. And I made some progress, but uh, the point is, I think this is a time when we need it more than ever. And, and we can talk about what we're seeing now unraveling with what Russia's doing, with what China's doing to some extent. And, and now, as if life isn't complicated enough, this very aggressive anti-science disinformation campaign, which is both homegrown in the United States and being launched by Russia. So how do we bring, how do we walk all this back and, and kind of restore vaccine diplomacy to its rightful place because of its incredible track record of success? Um, that's a great jumping off point. Um, you know, one of the things I've been observing in this, this pandemic, and I imagine you have as well, um, the vaccine diplomacy that's been going on has been exercised by the Chinese and the Russians, as opposed to the United States in, in large measure. Uh, you know, Chinese vaccines are being used in lots of countries around the world. Uh, lots of countries are planning to use or 
the, the Sputnik vaccine. And meanwhile, the United States is, has, you know, done the world a huge service in terms of helping manufacturers fast track development of vaccines, but it has purchased, you know, advanced pur purchased way more vaccine than it actually needs and is sitting on vaccine that it's not currently using. Um, who's winning the vaccine diplomacy uh, race right now? So uh, from my view, it's, it's really a race to the bottom. Um, Russia and China and the U.S. are all pivoting away from vaccine diplomacy, in, in my view, in, 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 in unique and interesting ways, sort of like the beginning of Anna Karenina, Anna Karenina uh, in, in very unique and interesting ways. They're all letting the world down. Um, so let's let's explore that. So let's look at Russia first. Um, yes, they're developing a vaccine, and yes, they're making it available um, to other countries. But let's look at that vaccine. It's bypassed WHO prequalification, so we don't know how, how um, we we don't really understand the true performance features of the vaccine. We don't know much about its quality control and quality assurance. Um, it's not gone through any stringent regulatory authorities, but defined by the WHO. And what the Russians are doing is uh, working with countries in a very transactional manner and making these bilateral relationships that bypass our very effective system of global governance around WHO pre-qualification of vaccines in this very transactional way, which to me smells more like something out of the Cold War rather than something that I would say is necessarily positive. And then in parallel, hey, you, you've- Can I stop you for a sec? I mean, mm -hmm. they haven't gotten pre-qualification or an EUL, the, the uh, WHO's um, equivalent of a, an emergency use authorization, which, which is the US term is a emergency use listing, an EUL. They haven't gotten one yet from WHO, but they are in the process, Gamalea, of, of they, they, you know, WHO says they are awaiting some additional data, but, but there is a, an assessment going on there, on there. Well, very late in the game, they started that process, but um, on, in my view, only after a lot of international pressure. I mean, if you remember, they essentially licensed the vaccine in the USSR even before beginning phase three clinical trials, yes. and we're already kind of peddling that. And, and I've been very critical of how the, the Russians have, have acted uh, uh, on that front, because in parallel, what they've also done is launched a very aggressive disinformation campaign against COVID-19 vaccines. This has been documented by um, US and British intelligence. And, and there's even now a new term for it. It's called weaponized health communication. So they're, they're piling on um, uh, very um, uh, aggressive uh, information about COVID-19 vaccines with, for the express purpose of destabilizing democracies, especially uh, the United States. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting how, um, you know, when I've criticized the Russians for how they've acted, they've responded in a very vigorous way, being very offended. And to which I say, you know, cry me a river, you know, this, I mean, here, here you're the single largest promoter of weaponized health communication and you're shocked that it's come back to bite you. And, uh, and, uh, and I, you know, i I don't have a lot of patience for it. And then with the, what the China, and I'll get to the U S in a minute, I have a lot of choice words for the U S as well, but for the Chinese, you know, um, you know, there the, again, it's bypass stringent regulatory authorities. They're, they're now, beginning, you know, inter interactions with WHO prequalification mechanism. When you look at the vaccines, the levels of virus neutralizing antibody are really low. They're not uh, the some of the the, the sign of and activated vaccines, uh, very low level of virus neutralizing antibody. Same with the CanSino bio adenovirus vaccine. I, I, I don't know. And I, you know, I'm very skeptical that it's going to have much of an impact for a lot of the variants of concern coming out of Brazil and South Africa. So that, that vaccine, those vaccines give me a lot of pause as well. Okay. Just, just to be clear for listeners, both um, CanSino or Sinopharm and Sinovac 
are currently uh, seeking. EDL. There's actually three. So there's Sinopharm, yes. which is an inactivated virus. There's Sinovac, which is an inactivated virus. Right. And there's CanSinoBio, which is the an adenovirus. Right, right. And vaccine. all three companies are uh, seeking uh, EULs from the World Health Organization. Th that process effectively gives the WHO's imprimatur to the vaccine and the, the data that support the vaccine for countries that don't have um, don't have as strong a regulatory uh, agencies as, as places like the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, they you know, are, and as, think, as, as opposed to India, for instance, which is, you know, um, for instance, with our vaccine that we're accelerating in India, working with Biological E, it's a recombinant protein vaccine. It's going through very carefully measured phase one, phase two trials. They're, locks, they're lock and step with WHO. They're consulting WHO on how to do the large phase three clinical trials. Um, they're working with the Indian regulatory authorities. In other words, it's very much lock and step with um, standard uh, expedited uh, in order to save lives, but being done in a very carefully measured fashion and in a very transparent way. Um, um, but yeah. then we could talk about the U.S. Sure. I just wanted to finish up with the point on the, the, the Chinese vaccines. I mean, they are before the WHO now um, with the Sin Sinopharm and the Sinovac. Uh, WHO thinks there may be an EUL decision, pro or con, uh, sometime this month at the earliest. And then I think that, um, let me see, can Sino that the rolling data started in this month. So that'll, you know, they don't give an estimate of when that might come, but it'll be probably a while. Um, I, I mean, I take your point about um, sort of lack of transparency. I mean, a lot of the Chinese data hasn't been um, published to, you know, in, in the outside literature. So it is hard sometimes to know how well those vaccines work. But they are providing vaccines to, you know, parts of the world that can't get anything else right now. Um, Which brings me to criticism of the United States. Yes. Let's, let's so, go there. so, so here's my my concern about what, how that's operated. Well, first of all, I am a big champion and supporter of the COVAX sharing facility. I think, you know, it was actually, um, I think it was, you know, it, Early on, there was a commitment to health equity by the global policymakers, and, and I think that's great. I think the problem has always been not so much the design of the COVAX facility, it's the fact that the science policymakers were so fixed on innovation that they, they wound up heavily promoting and pushing, not pushing, but heavily promoting and advancing vaccines that uh, brand new technologies, which probably don't have the ability to be scaled up at the level needed. Um, when mm. you think about the, the, the size of the task, a billion doses of, I mean, we're gonna need 1.1 1, 1 billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa, 650 million people in Latin America, 400 million people in the smaller low middle, in, low, low middle income countries of Asia. Mm -hmm. That's 2 billion people. That's probably 4 billion doses of vaccines. Mm -hmm. There's never in, in, in the next couple of years, we're just not going to have that ability to scale up the mRNA technology for that mm -hmm. purpose, or even a lot of the other uh, so-called Operation Warp Speed vaccines. You know, they, they went so heavy on innovation that there was never enough thought given, okay, do we have, what do we have as options for low cost, durable, unfussy vaccines like our recombinant protein vaccine that we can, you know, make make for the world. And so it's great that that Pfizer and BioNTech donated 238,000 doses to Rwanda. It's a, it's a drop in the bucket, right? I mean, it's, we're talking right. out of four, 4 billion doses. So when you get to it, there's really no plan. There's no plan for Africa, Latin America, and and many of the low and middle income countries for Asia, it's just going to kind of sort of trickle along mm -hmm. until some other vaccines uh, c come on board. And and that was a big source of frustration for our group because, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, no, I'm, please finish your thought and then I'll jump in. 
Well, you know, that was that was a big source of frustration for our group because we'd been making recombinant protein vaccines for, for a long time. And we had showed over the last 10 years in our coronavirus program how you can deliver the spike protein of the virus, induce high levels of virus neutralizing antibody. And we, when we got the COVID-19 sequence out of bioarchive from, from the Chinese who had put it up, we moved pretty quickly to develop that vaccine. And then it was like, okay, well, we, this is going to be an important vaccine for global health because it uses the same technologies, the hepatitis B vaccine that's been around for 40 years. You can make a bucket of it. You can make it cheaply. Our biological e-collaborators estimate about a dollar fifty a dose, which is going to be one of the least expensive mm -hmm. COVID nineteen vaccines. We couldn't get anybody to bite. I mean, we had to raise the money privately, which we did. I mean, we got we had about four hundred thousand dollars of NIH support um, from a, an extension of a previous grant. But then, you know, we wound up going to the Claybrook Foundation here in Texas and Tita's Vodka of all places. Uh, uh, here in Texas, uh, uh, the JPB Foundation, we, you know, and that's what I was doing the first, or we were doing the first six months of the pandemic. It was out there, you know, desperately seeking funds to accelerate our vaccine, which we quickly transferred to Biological E. Now, they're, now they can scale it up to a billion doses. Um, it's finishing phase two clinical trials. It's looking really promising. And, um, um, and so I think it's gonna end well but um, but it is interesting, you know. But it, but it's a good lesson learned on on what could have gone better um, had we had vac a better system of vaccine diplomacy in place. Are you convinced the lesson has been learned? Because m from where I sit, I could see that the lesson that um, you know the United States would have learned or certainly the UK, the EU, and these are places where a lot of the vaccines of the world are made, um, was that the, you know, whiz-bang brand new uh, technologies were the ones that produced vaccines really quickly and they produced vaccines that were really high efficacy. I mean, you know, all last last summer and last fall, I was telling colleagues, you know, everybody needs to be ready for the possibility that some of these vaccines are going to fail because typically that's what happens with vaccines. And when the first vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine came through with a 95% efficacy, it was staggering. And then Moderna shortly thereafter with 94. And, you know, because of the speed at which the, with which those vaccines could be designed and get into clinical trials, they came through a lot faster than everybody else. Um, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I also know that other recombinant vaccines are still being tested, which means it, even if they're more scalable, they're slower off the mark. And in a pandemic, that's not what you need. I, I, I do wonder if- Right, well, I, th I, don't, I think we're kind of saying the same thing in the sense that, uh, listen, I got the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. It's a good vaccine. Um, and, and I'm grateful for having received it. My point was there was not enough of a attention to balancing a portfolio mm -hmm. to advance vaccines that could be delivered to Africa and Latin America at scale. There was the every everybody went, you know, as what I sometimes say in my frustration to, for the shiny new toys that could and that we knew we could only make just enough for for North America and Europe, mm. and and not really uh, with without really having any knowledge at all that we could make a, a those vaccines at scale for for the rest of the world. And there should have been a greater balance. So the question then is, okay, knowing that and knowing that could happen again, what new infrastructure needs to be put in place in order to not let that happen again? I think the other interesting scientific lesson is the vaccines that I would have predicted would have been the most effective were not necessarily. And, and you know, I was as surprised as anyone that the mRNA proved out to be so 
um, such a transformative technology. For instance, when we started, I, th I would have put my, you know, if I were betting, I would have put my, my, my chits down on uh, the Merck VSV vaccine that was so effective for Ebola. Um, right. I thought it you know, was this, effective this, in th one dose. It, it, like yeah, and that was a transformative vaccine. I mean, it, in terms mm -hmm. of its impact and and its ability to mitigate the Ebola epidemic in Congo, I thought you know that's going to be the one. Uh, yeah. But it turned out not to be successful at all. So it is kind of interesting, also that you that you do have to. I mean, the the smart thing about whether you call it Operation Warp Speed or the U.S. vaccine program is they did have the wisdom to try multiple different technologies. My criticism is they needed to add some old, they should have added some old school technologies in that portfolio. Yeah, they clearly chose not to. And, and um, you know, given that that vaccine was, that program was effectively designed to deliver vaccine to the American public as opposed to the world, you, you can criticize it, but it, it may have made sense in that context, I, you know, but that has well, well we did have a government at that time that talked that that, yeah, yeah. that that campaign on something called america first so right. i guess they were true to that uh yes but you know it does have that downstream effects as well because you know the the vaccines that get fast-tracked here are the ones that will eventually be you know available to other countries and available to covax you mentioned covax earlier for people who may not know what that is that's the um uh, effort by the World Health Organization, an organization called CEPI, which is called is the Coalition for Epidemic um, Preparedness, Preparedness Innovations, and GAVI, the Vaccine Alliance. The three entities have come together to put together this fund to try to purchase vaccines and disseminate them to low and middle income countries that don't have the capacity to either make their own or don't have the which, economic which by, to buy their by own. The way, yeah, which by the way, I point out, um, look, sepi has got the word innovation in their name, right? So that's that's mm -hmm. what their charter was. That's what their remit was. So you can't really blame them uh, entirely. It's just that what we need now is to look at what's missing to ensure that the world's low and middle income countries can continually produce vaccines. and. And there may be multi, and I think the model of relying exclusively on the multinational pharmaceutical companies, hoping something trickles down, has worked at times. But it, I think in this case, it, it hasn't. And well, at this in this case, I mean, you mentioned the Merck vaccine that failed. Merck had two vaccines that failed. Sanofi had has two vaccines. The first one, it it may not have failed, but their trial of it failed, and they had to go back and restart their phase two. I mean, these are two of the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world and definitely the people you would have put money on at right. the, from the start to say that they would have vaccines early and neither of them have one yet. Um, all that said, you know, there's going to be a next iteration of vaccines. I mean, as you point out, um, you know, there are scaling issues. The, you know, there isn't the capacity to make mRNA vaccines at the scale that the world needs them to be made at. And, um, and they're very expensive. You know, one could imagine that the vaccines that are successful in the first round of vaccination in the early stages or the acute phases of this, uh, you know, our interactions with uh, the SARS-2 virus may not be the ones that are around that will be used year after year or every five years or whatever. I mean, do you see sort of a reckoning and a rationalization of the, the vaccine um, landscape coming? You know, maybe a chance for vaccines like the one you're producing with biologically or other, you know, the one Novavax is producing, which is a recombinant so, vaccine so, to come forward and be more dominant players. Yeah, so a, a couple of things, both specifically with SARS-2 and in more general. I think, first of all, I think the mRNA technology, this is just version 1.0, it will get better, right? I mean, eventually we will figure out how to scale it up, I think, um, in the billions of doses. Eventually we may even figure out how to keep that 
keep those lipid nanoparticles stable at room temperature. That wouldn't surprise me either. So the technology will will get more version does not need the cold, you know, CureVac is, is developing one with GSK. I don't think so, it requires the. So I think, culture. so I think the technology will improve. Having said that, you know, it, in some ways, the spike protein of the coronavirus was a soft target and pretty much anything that induces viral, high levels of virus neutralizing antibody works against COVID-19. So that um, maybe this was not the best test case. You know, it could be that mm. the next pathogen that comes along, the RNA technology won't work, and then we'll need to go back to the to the Merck VSV technology or recombinant protein. So we're going to need a lot of versatility. And I think one of the answers, and it's not the only answer, is to really build up indigenous capacity for develop for developing vaccines and producing vaccines, especially for diseases which are of regional importance, but not mm. necessarily global importance. So for instance, right now, there are no vac no new vaccines are made on the African continent. No new vaccines are made in the Middle East, maybe with the exception of Iran. Um, barely anything is made in Latin America. Fiocruz, Butantan in, in Brazil have had fits and starts of late, mm -hmm. Cuba a little bit, Mexico a little bit, but really have underachieved. And I think that's one thing that we have to look at is how we can build that capacity. And it's not just building factories, um, but there isn't the human capital. Right. And we have to figure out how to train a cadre of vaccine scientists who know about quality control and quality assurance, who know how to um, produce things at scale, who understand vaccine regulatory science. And that's a long-term building project, which we haven't really seen a lot of interest in that. So now I'm working with a very interesting guy named uh, Dr. Patrick Sun Ching, who's uh, owner of the LA Times and um, uh, has done very well in biotech. He's a surgeon by training of Chinese descent, but grew up in South Africa and wants to give back. So I'm we're having some really interesting discussions about working with him to build capacity in Africa. And I think with my, and with my science co-partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Patazzi, we're looking at how to do, she's from Honduras, how we can build that in Latin America. I think India is a good example of what can be done. Um, they've probably excelled, you know, in terms of providing vaccines for low and middle income countries as, as well as anyone. But so how can we, franchise that Indian model or adapt it to Africa, Latin America, poor, other poor countries in Asia and the Middle East. I think that could be an important next wave to look at. What, what are the economics of that, though? I mean, you know, you've mentioned the um, Merck uh, Ebola vaccine. I don't know if people understand this, but that vaccine targets only um, Ebola Zaire, the Ebola Zaire virus, and there are multiple other uh, Ebola viruses that that vaccine won't do anything for. We fortunately haven't had outbreaks of Ebola Sudan or Ebola Bundabugyo lately, nor have we had uh, outbreaks of Marburg for quite a number of years. Marburg is a is a close cousin to Ebola. It's a phylovirus. It effectively, so. yeah, phylovirus. Uh, I'm not telling you this stuff, I'm telling people who are listening, but um, it's a phylovirus that is, uh, that, you know, acts in virtually the same way as Ebola and has, you know, devastating outbreaks with fairly high uh, fatality rates. There's no um, Marburg vaccine. You know, the work that was done to develop the Merck vac Ebola vaccine would suggest that that approach would probably be useful for all of the others. But, you know, if there were an outbreak of any of those uh, other Ebola strains tomorrow or Marburg, we would have nothing. And I, I'm not certain that I see that changing in the near future because of the economics for companies like Merck or whatever. How do that, we that, get there? That's, that's right. So if you're a large for-profit company, the economics don't work because at the end of the, the end of the day, it's vaccines you're stockpiling, right? It's not vaccine you're selling. And, and the, the financial market is, is probably going to be limited and, and not enough economic incentives. So I think the, the, and I think the pharmaceutical companies do what they can. You know, I think, you know, if I've, and I remember a few years ago talking to with, with the Merck people um, 
and who will be nameless. And they said, you know, Peter, if we had to do it all over again, we probably wouldn't because, you know, even though there was some BARDA money that came from the Obama administration, it didn't nearly pay for all of the people that we had to pull from, you know, financial projects that brought in a big financial return. So yes, it was an incredible humanitarian gesture, but right. the finances weren't there. Somehow we have to figure figure out a way to incorporate in the model that that these vaccines do a lot more than promote public health. That they de- that they stabilize economies. They actually uh, promote global security. I mean, if if it wasn't for right. that Merck vaccine, I'm I'm a firm believer that virus could have destabilized the whole African continent and would have produced a humanitarian catastrophe, you know, as bad as what we're looking at now with, with, with COVID-19 and, and, but, you know, putting dollars and cents on that is, is really hard. And so in the book, one of the things that I, you know, I don't, I don't claim to have the answer, but one of the answers is building that local capacity, but also getting greater involvement of the G20 countries. Um, Cause I think part of the problem is, we're too dependent on uh, the U.S. government, the U.K. government, that country called the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, you know, maybe a couple of the, the other Western European countries. countries are yeah, the Nordic more. countries. We, you know, we, we've got to, you know, we've China's got to do more. Japan's got to do more. Korea's got to do more. Um, Indonesia's got to do more. Brazil's got to do more because the G20 countries account for about 85 to 87 percent of the global economy. Mm-hmm. And um, and of course it's in their enlightened self interest to do it, uh, but uh, it's it's not an easy sell. And and when I and when you talk about the money we're talking about, um, and this is why I like working with macroeconomists like Jeffrey Sachs. You know when I when I quote him a number of a few couple of billion dollars, I mean he looks at me and he says, Peter, that's a rounding error. That's mm-hmm. that's nothing, right? I mean that's and he's right, but you still need that up, upfront investment, and that's what we have to look. At. And I think, and I think you know to the credit of the global policymakers, that's what SEPI tri- aspired to do. I think you right, know, and they, they had they, trouble raising two two billion dollars. Yeah. That's right. They, that's right. Had tr- like they were having that's trouble right. last year yeah. raising two billion dollars. Yeah. yeah, and my other, and my other, the other, my other issue with SEPI is they only focused really on the pandemic threats. They didn't really look at any of the poverty-related and neglected diseases that we also work on that we need vaccines for. And nobody's really talking about that. You know, vaccines for female genital schistosomiasis, which affects forty million girls and women in sub-Saharan Africa, one of the leading gynecologic conditions, or Chagas disease. These are the vaccines that we actually spend most of our time working on. We adopted a coronavirus vaccine program 10 years ago because we had an opportunity to work with the New York Blood Center, but our work has always been about parasitic disease vaccines, and that's really tough to get financed, Um, even though... The, you know, we can work with people like Bruce Lee at City University in New York, who can not only show these parasitic disease vaccines are not only cost effective, they're economically dominant, they're cost savings, but you still need that investment and no one's figured out that model. So, you know, I, Helen, like you, I'm sure I, you know, every time I give a lecture pre, pre-pandemic, pre-apocalypse, I'd always be followed you know, there'd always be a small line of students, whether it's doctoral students or undergraduates coming up to me say, hey, Dr. Hotez, I'm all in. How do I get into this? I want to do something big in global health. And they're often profound. They think I'm going to tell them to get an MD or a PhD in tropical diseases. And they're often <laughs> profoundly disappointed when I tell them to get an MBA. And, uh, and because, you know, we need as much innovation and sustainable financing as we do in, in, in the actual science. Yeah. That's this is fascinating. Um, can we circle back to you know when we were talking about um, China and, and Russia and their vaccines and the you know we sort of touched on the U.S. situation, but we haven't really dug into something that I'm um, quite concerned about, and that's the fact that there are you know at least several tens of millions of doses of uh, AstraZeneca vaccine that the US currently has and isn't using uh, and isn't, you know, that vaccine or AstraZeneca hasn't yet applied for a emergency use authorization. Um, the thinking is that will come later this month, maybe even early May. 
which means that, uh, you know, that vaccine might not be authorized for use until sometime later in May. Uh, meanwhile, you know, by the end of this month, I believe there's supposed to be 50 million doses in that are available to the United States that are being used. I think the contract was for 300 million, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. But, but, you know, in terms of vaccine doses in hand, um, by the end of this month, I believe it's supposed to be 50 million. Is it conscionable that that's sitting in a warehouse somewhere as opposed to, you know, being used somewhere that would use that vaccine right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish it was, we were talking about a different vaccine, but there's so many complexities of this one. So let's, there's let's layers just, upon let's, layers. Okay, let, before we go into that, let, let's, and I would so like let's just to- call, Let's just let's, call it vaccine X for yes, a minute. Vaccine okay. X, excess yeah. doses that can't be used in the United States at this current time. Yeah, so, so I think so. Um, on the other hand, as I point out, um, it, it's still a drop in the bucket. Um, you know, even if they unloaded course, 50 but million doses. Of course, a bucket only gets filled drops at a time. I guess, I guess. But, you know, again, we need 4 billion doses of, of vaccine. So, you know, if if they were to donate that strategically to, you know, you pick, you know, for those 50 million doses, you could probably immunize most of Central America, for instance. I think that could be game changing and that could be really important. I'm not confident that particular vaccine may ever, they may not even apply for emergency use in the U.S. because I'm not convinced it's going to wind okay. up being used. They, they may do it. And I think it's important to do for the optics because if right. you, if, if for whatever reason, there is no emergency use authorized for that vaccine, it just sends a chilling effect um, about the confidence in that vaccine for the Americas. And so that, that I, I, I would agree that that vaccine would benefit immensely from the scrutiny that the FDA will give it that, you know, the process that the FDA has where, you know, they analyze in case people watching don't understand this, the FDA is unique in that it takes raw data from country companies. It doesn't it doesn't accept the company's assessment of what the data show. It takes the raw data and reanalyzes it and says, this is what the clinical trials have shown us. And, um, you know, because the data for the AstraZeneca vaccine have been so all over the place, uh, the data generated outside of the United States, having the FDA go through that process will be hugely valuable, I think, to that vaccine. And also one of the things that the FDA does that is unique is that it holds a public hearing. It, it calls uh, together an uh, independent panel of experts and it asks it a bunch of questions. And these people really kick the tires of the data hard. Um, that, that vaccine will benefit enormously from both of those things, I think. Um, but before we talk too much about the AZ vaccine, um, you know, should the U.S. be doing more to get to free up some of the vaccine commitments that it has that it's not going to use? I mean, it, you know, the company, the country has purchased 300 million doses from Pfizer, 300 million doses from Moderna. That's enough for effectively all the adults in the country. It's getting vaccine from J&J, &J, which is a one dose vaccine. Um, it has a commitment for 110 million doses from Novavax, which is not yet authorized for use, but it will be at some point, presumably later this spring. Uh, yeah, it has so, other so, commitments. So, Shouldn't it be freeing other commitments up? So here's what I think. I think the U.S. does need to reassert some leadership in global health, including around vaccines, because we lost a lot of ground over the last four years by withdrawing from COVAX, withdrawing from WHO. So I think there is a rebuilding process. I think donating vaccine is a component of that, mm -hmm. but there's there's bigger pieces to that. I think, for instance, for one, I mean, these the vaccine that we're accelerating now which India is making 1.2 billion doses, that was developed through support of the NIH. And, and that's a great um, example of vaccine diplomacy. 
if we can um, have biological E scale that up to a billion doses and and help support the phase three phase three trials internationally in the emergency use in India, I think in the long run that might be more impactful than than donating doses i think and i think it's not either or i think we should be doing both but i think the but u.s should, should be i mean you're, you're but it's not that long a run i mean we're talking um you we, haven't done we, phase two we finished like, phase we finished phase two we're finishing okay. up the data analysis going to go into phase three very soon and by the fall it should be you know if all the stars align of course you never know things could go wrong but if you know or hit some speed bumps but if the stars align by the fall this thing you know, we could have a billion doses ready to go out to the world. That that's where I'd like to see also some of the U.S. support us a, a bit more. Right. Uh, in terms Is of the manufacturer of... able to to come up with all the components and the vials and whatnot? Because they did. So that's if you been remember, a real problem. It, so if you remember, the Biden administration made a comment uh, about at at the what do they call it? The four. What am I missing? The four. It, it's Australia. Um, Australia, India, there's four oh, countries. The, Brazil? No, it's four Asian countries. I forget what they call it. At that meeting, they announced that they are going to support BioE biologically. And it, it's for, you know, relaxing some of the Prote Defense Production Act things to make, okay. the, to make the vaccine available. So, but there's more to be done. So I think I'd like to see the U.S., you know, in parallel with donating vaccine, uh, I, I hope that the commitment would not only be donating vaccine because the impact of that is, is going to be very modest. It's, it's, it's trying to scale up production of our vaccines like ours, where you can really provide billions of doses. I think that would be more of a game changer. Okay. Um, I, I see that time is ticking on. I wanted to ask you how you feel about um, where the pandemic is now both in the United States and internationally uh, you know numbers here had been coming down quite markedly and then sort of stabilized and now appear to be ticking up um, you know the variants are spreading in on the continent particularly b117 the variant that was first spotted in the United Kingdom which is both substantially more transmissible and also, more causes more you know a greater degree of severe disease uh, you know where are we going are we heading into a substantial fourth wave here yeah well there's a few things and i also want to touch on you know the other component of the book which is this rise in anti-science which really worries me as well okay. which is also going to interfere i think in the u.s um, we are already seeing the beginning of that fourth wave, um, and there will be, a, there is a fourth wave. It's, I, I just don't know what the amplitude of the peak is, whether it's going to be a hill or whether it's going to be a mountain. Um, things are not looking that great in Michigan, although it's different, right? We're not seeing a lot of so many older people losing their lives like the past few peaks, but instead it's younger people going into hospital uh, getting sick, but the numbers are going up clearly in Michigan and Minnesota. Younger people are getting sick. We're starting now to see the rise in Florida as well. So wherever you, it looks to me like wherever you see the B117 variant go up above 60, 70 percent, then the numbers start going back up, which by the way includes Texas. So the numbers have not been going up, which is interesting, but the, but the percent B117 variant is looks to me similar in the states where it has gone up. So the, is it just a question of time or are there other things going on? So I am worried about the the fourth wave and, and all I can say is we just need to, um, one, aggressively vaccinate and work as fast as we can. And if we can vaccinate the American people by June, I think that would be a huge difference. And then it's going to be a matter of, as I say, how big the amplitude of the peak is going to be and how many people lose their lives and get long haul COVID uh, over the next two months. Um, but we, I, I am optimistic we are going to vaccinate our way out of this. Um, we will have to deal later on with uh, the South African Brazil variant, maybe some other variants of concern. And I think for that, we'll wind up boosting. So I think we'll probably see a third dose of the Pfizer Moderna vaccine that'll be 
specifically tailored for one of those variants, maybe the South African variant, which is similar to the Brazil one. I think we'll see a second dose of the J&J vaccine, which will also be a fine-tuned. And then we'll see what happens after that. I, Some think we'll need to do this annually. I don't think so at this point. I think if, as long as the durability of protection is strong, that may be it for a while. Um, one more boost and, and then and then that's it for a while. So the, I have a lot of optimism about the United States, other than this rise in anti-science, which is doing everything it can to undermine it and coming out of political extremism on the right, which unfortunately now is a mainstream component of the Republican Party. I never saw that coming. That's That really worries me. Um, I never thought I'd be targeted by Laura Ingram at night on Fox News, but there, <laughs> there she is. She's after me. Um, she's created this pantheon of, um, of, uh, of anti-heroes. She's got me up there with Tony and uh, Vivek, and it's just crazy what's going on. In Europe, I think the UK is going to be in good shape. Um, I think ultimately some of the Western European countries will get this under control. I'm, I'm scared what's happening in Eastern Europe right now. It looks terrible what's going on in Poland, Hungary. Hmm. And again, um, this thing is just ripping through in Africa and Latin America. And I, I don't, you know, unless something like our vaccine or some others can come through, I don't see that mitigating any time soon. And that's going to continue to destabilize the global economy. It's going to continue to prevent the U.S. from having a full recovery. Yes, we'll be able to fly domestically, but I don't see a lot of international travel in, for the rest of the year. Um, and so the economy will pick up in the U.S., but without the rest of the world, bringing along the rest of the world with it, it's going to slow things down. So we do have a question from somebody who wants to know you know, to that, to, to that issue, what's going to happen, you know, if the recovery or the ending of the acute phase is, it is by definition going to be uh, occur at different times in different places, certainly, and especially depending on how well vaccines are rolled out. What happens if, you know, a country that this person mentioned, potentially Iran, but any country sort of resists vaccinating in large measure. I mean, are we going to get to the place where there are going to be no go zones? You know, how will international travel resume over the next few years, do you think? That's right. I mean, if if these this pandemic continues to go unabated and, and we start seeing ver additional variants, I mean, it is interesting that we're seeing somewhat of a convergence of the variants. I mean, we're not seeing every and all mutation in the spike protein, right. there seem to be some recurring themes um, within the 501 position, the 484 position, but I would imagine something similar to the South African or Brazil variants going to be accelerating all over the world. And that uh, other than the places where everybody's vaccinated and boosted and, and that's, that really worries me. And so, yeah, I mean, if, uh, um, if I, I'm not, uh, if well, I, I'll I'll probably start to travel domestically, um, not a lot, but some. And but I'm not. I don't have any. Maybe I'd fly to Israel. Maybe I'd fly to the UK. But you know, I don't plan on unless you know for humanitarian reasons. I'm not planning any big trips uh, abroad in Asia or Latin America or, or, or Latin America, even Mexico right now. It's which is so yeah. so terrible. And, um, and that's why we have to fix that as soon as possible. Yeah, um, we are rapidly running out of time. Somebody who's listening wants to know about the status of um, vaccines for kids. Um, I know that several of the manufacturers that have already gotten emergency use authorizations are, are uh, testing their vaccines in children at to lower and lower levels can you talk to us about you know where things stand on that and how soon you would expect yeah let me go to them? let me go to college students high school students middle school students and elementary school students college i think colleges uh are likely going to require vaccinations most universities and colleges just like when my youngest son went off to college uh, uh he had to get show proof of his meningococcal vaccinations, meningococcal B and ACWY, I think that's going to be very reasonable to require um, 
uh, COVID-19 vaccines. That may be the only situation where we have vaccine mandates, which we can go into. I, I would not push too hard on the mandate issue right now because this the our conservative brothers and sisters are already gearing up for a war, and I think that war would be counterproductive uh, at this point. I think for high schools and junior high schools, middle schools, we'll have the data to support vaccinating adolescents. We already have that for the for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So I could imagine by the fall, uh, significant numbers of high school, middle school, middle middle school, I can't even say it, middle school students will be uh, vaccinated, and that's uh, and that's going to be great because the teachers will be vaccinated, the staff, that'll be safe. I think for the little kids, that's going to that's not going to move as quickly. And the reason I say that is because of the uh, MISC syndrome, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, that seems to be a delayed response to COVID-19. I think the regulators and the companies will be want to be very careful that the vaccine is not triggering MISC uh, or making things worse, that there's not some kind of autoimmune uh, reaction going on. And I, I think it won't be a problem, but I think it'll slow people down in terms of testing. So I don't see having that data available till, till next year. Right, and that's... then how far, how low you go down in terms of age, that's going to depend on a few things. I think we will be vaccinating pregnant women and, and newborns will be born with antibodies on board. So it may be like a, maybe use like a measles vaccine where we give it at one year of age um, because of the um, maternal antibodies on board prior to that. That may be one scenario that plays out. Oh, I'm not sure about anyone else, but that was an incredibly fast hour. I feel like I could sit here all day. There's just so much experience and knowledge in the both of your heads. Thank you so, so very much for this conversation this morning. It's been really fascinating. Um, I want to also thank all of you that, that joined us, whether you're joining us live this morning or joining us with the recorded version. Um, I hope that you continue to join us for some of the other virtual programs that the Health Museum has coming up. Um, next month, we'll be doing a, a series on mental health, the Mental Health Days with Menninger, with the Menninger Clinic. Um, that will begin the second week of May. We also have some programming coming up with the MD Anderson Cancer Center on uh, cancer symptoms that women, not, women should not ignore during Women's Health Awareness Week, also in May. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Helen, it's, it's, it's been a privilege to have you on. Dr. Hotez, as always, we're so, so grateful for you to take time out of your schedule to join us. Um, I hope that you all have a, a wonderful day and a great rest of the week. Bye all. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks.